And so many people are disappointed and disillusioned with church. It's just a place of dysfunctional people perpetuating their dysfunctionality on the rest of the world. But beloved, while there is an element of truth to the dysfunctionality of the church, what if we were to be inspired by a new metaphor, a metaphor of a functioning fellowship? together. Amen. Beloved, it's good to see you. Thank, thank you for braving the raindrops on this wet Sunday morning. We Baptists typically don't like to get wet but once. But we thank God that you are here today and we appreciate your presence and your sacrifice is duly noted. This is our emphasis day for fellowship, and so I want to direct your attention to a very familiar passage of scripture, one that is not foreign to any of us who are students of the word, but just because you know something doesn't mean that you ought not revisit it every now and then. And so I encourage you to come with me to the first letter to the church at Corinth chapter 12 and commencing at verse 4 and concluding at verse 13 we'll find our preaching passage for today you know that we have a long-standing covenant over 17 years now that a long scripture does not equate to a long sermon that is if you help me amen, amen. y'all remember the contract all right 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning at verse 4, we find these words. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is, it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the discernment of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same Spirit who allots to each one individually just as the Spirit chooses. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one Spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of the one spirit. Thus ends the reading of the word, amen. I want to talk just for a few moments from the subject, the functioning fellowship. The functioning fellowship. Beloved, I submit to you by observation and anecdotal evidence that the church has fallen on hard times. And for many of us, our perceptions of the contemporary church is one of dysfunction and disease. We hear phrases like, there's no hurt like church hurt that 
we echo the sentiments that the church is full of hypocrites. Those are just a few. I'm sure you can pick the one that resonates most with you, the one you heard at the barber shop or the beauty parlor. We seem to be in a time where our perceptions of the church are that of dysfunction and malfunction. And that's partly because many of us see the church as the place where there ought to be such high expectations. And yet we see such great competition and comparison. Many of us want to pit one church against another, one ministry against another, one board against another, one choir against another, simply to compare so that they adhere to our personal preferences. And that leads to an unhealthy competition, a competition that pits one against the other and in the process devalues one and elevates one unnecessarily to a position of superiority and primacy. That's because the church is viewed in our age as a place of dysfunction. But beloved, what would it be like if we had an alternative perspective of the church? What if we had a view of the church that moved beyond what the late church historian James Malvern Washington deemed of we Baptists a frustrated fellowship and could move into a metaphoric reality that really gave us a church that was not frustrated, but one that was functioning. What would happen if we all saw the church as a place that was vital and vibrant and functioning? Now, I need to issue a caveat here, beloved, because the church is to some degree dysfunctional. And that's because there are dysfunctional people in the church, from the pulpit to the pew, even to the pavement, there are no perfect people. And when you walk through the doors of the church, you don't become a saint overnight. You bring your grief, you bring your woes, you bring your hardships, you bring your quirks, you bring your sins all to the church. Because there are no perfect people. But what if we had a metaphor that could look beyond our imperfections and idiosyncrasies and could view the church as functioning properly? That's what Paul does here to this Corinthian church. A church that indeed was mired in competition mired in dysfunction and bogged down in personal preferences. For there the church was so divided into little cliques that they uh, gathered themselves into their own silos by saying, I am of Paul. I am of Cephas. Some said, I'm of Jesus. But they forgot, beloved, that the vital instrumentality of the church, as Paul reminds them, is that there are many members, but one body. He uses this metaphor of the body to extol for us the value and the virtue of a functioning church. It is believed by some scholars who have excavated the landscape of Corinth that Paul got the metaphor by walking through the streets of Corinth. For in Corinth, a seaport town, there was a temple to the god of Aeschylus, a god in the Roman and Greek pantheon that was the god of healing. And it was the practice among the people there in Corinth that they would make a cast of whatever their dysfunctional body part was. 
and lay it at the temple of Aeschylus as a way of devotion and prayer so that whatever ailed them might get healed. So even now, if you go to Corinth, there in the museum at Corinth, you'll see cast of body parts from the first century. Arms that have been maligned, other body parts, genitalia that have been deformed because of sexually transmitted diseases. It's all distorted, but as Paul walked through the streets and saw the various cast of, of maligned and malformed body parts, he took upon himself to say of the body of Christ, there are many members, but only one body. And in order for that body to function properly, every part must play their part. He reasons with them and says, now, what if the ear wanted to be like the toe? And what if the fingers wanted to play the role of the nose? You would have a dysfunctional physical composition. But if the body is to work like the body is designed to work, then the nose has to be about the business of smelling. And the fingers must be about the business of feeling. The arms must be about the business of lifting. And the feet must be about the business of holding up the body and moving about by walking. Only when you do your proper part does the body work as it is designed. And beloved, that is a vision of a functioning fellowship. There is, according to the apostle, a diversity of gifts. A diversity of gifts. Not everybody has the same gift. But I tell folk all the time that I can't do what I'm supposed to do in the pulpit on Sunday unless you do what you're supposed to do in the pew Monday through Saturday. We can't function without everybody's cooperation. And when you play your role and we don't devalue anybody's role, then we have a functioning fellowship. Because we are so prone to hear, to receive accolades and to hear our names called, we often do things not to function, but to gain glory. But I submit to you this morning that when you get to the point where you just want to serve God by doing whatever you do, and do it well, and do it to the glory of God, honor will come to even, as Paul says, the most undistinguished, indistinguished parts, for they receive the greater honor. So what makes the body functional? What, what, what makes this metaphor provocative as a fellowship that can be functional. Well, the first thing that I see here that many of us fail to recognize is that every member of the church is gifted. Y'all not walking with me. Every member is gifted. Y'all still ain't feeling me. I said every member is gifted. We often assign giftedness to the clergy and to those in leadership, but I'm here to burst your proverbial bubble. Every member has at least one gift. Oh, I don't know what your gift is, but my Bible tells me there are a diversity of gifts. And so whatever it is you can do, do that to the glory and honor of God. Everybody has a gift. 
problem becomes when you begin to compare your gift to my gift or somebody else's gift. I'm not as eloquent as the clergy. I'm not as wise and prudent as the seniors. I don't have the youthful vitality of the young. And so I'm just going to sit down and do nothing. But I want you to know that, baby, you got a gift. And, and, and your gift will make room for you in the body of Christ. You have a gift. God has given you something unique to you. And even though somebody else may have the same gift, don't nobody do it like you do it. Nobody can do it the way you do it. I am the only James E. Victor Jr. in the world. And even though I got some cousins that are named James E. Victor Jr., I'm the only James E. Victor Jr. like this James E. Victor Jr. I want you to know, beloved, that you are one of a kind. God has gifted you in miraculous and spectacular ways. You are gifted. So your gift may not ever shine in the body of Christ publicly on a Sunday morning. But whatever you can do, do it to the glory of God. If you can read the four pages of a contract, do it to the glory of God. If you can sweep floors like nobody else can sweep floors, do it to the glory of God. If you can encourage another like no one else, encourage another. If you can believe in spite of all of the odds and obstacles, then believe like nobody else. Whatever you do, do it to the glory of God. And your gift will always make room for you first thing that makes the church functional is that we've got to come to grips with the fact that all of us are gifted. Second thing that I see here is that our gifts are governed by the same spirit. That's, that's Bible. Y'all can say man right there. Our gifts are governed by the same spirit. Whatever you are capable of doing, you didn't just get it because you practiced real hard. And you didn't get it because you have honed your skills and your craft. But you got it because the Lord gave it to you. It's governed by the spirit. And what I have discovered that when God gives you something, if you give it back to him, he'll bless it and multiply it. So you might be able to sing like an angel, but if you have no anointing, you're going to always be flat. You may be able to preach like Paul, but if you don't give your gift of eloquence back to the Lord who gave it to you, you'll always go to front there. So whatever you do, give it back to God and God will make it come to life. It's governed by God. God gives these special abilities and animates them for the building up of the body of Christ and for the church to be a vital functioning fellowship in the world. You're gifted. You're governed by the Spirit. And then there must be a generosity in the body of Christ. For you see, beloved, there are many gifted individuals. In fact, all of us, again, are gifted. But some people withhold their gifts. But when the body functions in at its optimum capacity, 
Everybody is giving his or her all. The, the nose is giving its olfactory capacity. The ear is giving its audacious capacity. The fingers are giving their digital capacity. What capacity do you have that you need to give to the Lord so that the body functions well and the body is vibrant? What talent, what gift, what capacity shall you render unto the Lord? When you can give that generously, then I submit to you that the church then takes on new life. Too many people sitting around with gifts and the church is not functioning as it ought. But with a spirit of generosity, then we move to new levels of capacity. What do you have? What do you have? And when God wants something from you, that is the penetrating question. What do you have? When Moses was leading the children across the Red Sea, the people were complaining because there were mountains on both sides. Pharaoh's army was in hot pursuit. The Red Sea blocked their forward progression. Moses cries out to the Lord and God's question is not one of deliverance but one of capacity. What do you have? Which required Moses to do some inventory looked around and said, all I got is a stick. And the Lord said, well, stretch out your stick. And when Moses stretched out his stick, the Bible says an east wind came and stacked up the waters and the people marched forward on dry ground. All you got to do is just give God what you got and he'll make some ways out of no ways. If you give God what you got, he'll make room for you in his plan of salvation. If you just use what you got. So I wonder, do I have anybody here that's willing to stretch out your voice, stretch out your checkbook, stretch out your generosity, stretch out compassion, stretch out, and the Lord will make way. Functioning fellowship gives generously. And because of the mechanical and physiological design of the body. When you do what you do, and I do what I do, and when you do what you do, and you do what you do, and we put it all together, then God makes this thing come to life in new ways. But the converse is also true, that if you do what you do, then when I can't do what I do, there's still a vitality to the body of Christ because there's somebody that has your back. So beloved, when you can't sing, there's somebody that can make a joyful noise. When you can't give, there's somebody with a spirit of generosity that'll give what you can't give. When you are saddened, there's somebody with a spirit of hospitality that'll welcome the stranger with a smile when you can't. When you do what you can, and there's somebody that can give a word of encouragement. There's somebody that'll pat you on the back and remind you that baby it'll be all right when you put what you got in I put what I got and it all comes together with 
the dynamism to deliver the kingdom of God to the world. And we do that, beloved, because we are not isolated, according to the text, from the head of the church. For we are baptized into one body by the one spirit. And because there's the head of the body. I know y'all think that the pastor is the head of the church, but I didn't die for you. I ain't got no nail prints in my hand and I don't have any scars on my, on my brow, but, but there's one. When we act like he acts, then the body takes on new life. So he's the one that when I'm sad, he's my joy. When I'm lost, he's my deliverer. When I'm crying, he's my friend. When I'm, when I'm dejected, he is my joy. When I'm incapable, he's my keeper. If I can just act like Jesus, who stands in the gap every now and then, that when I can't, he can. When I can't see my way, he makes a way. When I can't get through, he is the way. When I'm in darkness, he is my light. Say yeah, I'm glad that there's someone who holds it all together. So beloved, church may have fallen on bad times but I just believe because it's right here in the word that just as there's one body there are many members knit together and we all drink from the same spirit what would happen if the church got drunk What would happen if we got drunk not on Dom Perignon or that might be too high for some. Let me bring it down. What happened not on Mad Dog 2020 but what if the church got high as Cootie Brown on the life giving spirit of God? Let me, let me see if I can't make this thing plain. H have you ever seen somebody get towed up? I mean, show enough toe up. And when they get drunk, they often do the opposite of what their normal capacity and spirit and personality is. So the one that gets quiet, when he gets full, starts talking all the time. The one that was standoffish is not the one when he gets full. Is the one that wants to go hugging on everybody. What if the church was to get drunk on the spirit of the living God? We might start acting just like the body of Christ. If we got drunk on the spirit, then we start welcoming the unwelcomable. If we got drunk on the spirit, we start loving the unlovable. If we got drunk on the spirit, we feed hungry college children. If we got drunk on the spirit, somebody might catch on fire and burn with the Holy Ghost. I declare we ought to look up to heaven and say, feel me. Y'all missed that. Fill me with your spirit. Fill me to overflowing. Fill me till my cup runs over. Fill me. Fill me. Fill me with your spirit, Lord. And I'll be satisfied. Like the woman at the well, I came thirsty, but fill my cup, Lord. 
I lift it up, Lord. Fill my cup and let it overflow. Get drunk. That's not admonition and advice you usually get from the pulpit. But I'm not talking about getting drunk on spirits with the little less. I'm talking about an inebriation that comes on the big S. Yeah, fill me with your spirit, Lord. And we will then be a functioning fellowship. There may be somebody here today. That has a desire. No, not just desire, but a need. To be in a functioning fellowship. If there is one that is tired of living a life of isolation. In a time such as this where there is such global dislocation, the whole world is moving about. As Toni Morrison says in her last work, those that have been colonized are moving to the capitals of their colonizers. The whole world is in flux. There's no longer a sense of belonging. We live by the flotsam and jotsam of modernity and postmodernity. Over here one day, over there the next. Used to be a time when you hoped to retire after 30 or 40 years and get a gold watch. Now folk change jobs like they change underwear. Almost on a daily basis. Dislocation. And so there's a deep longing to belong to something that has a degree of permanence yes it's fluid but permanent and so therefore I offer you today the body of Christ it's been around now for two millennia sometimes it's been wrong and sometimes it has been the moral compass of the world sometimes it's been oppressive and yet there are times when it has been used for the liberation of the oppressed. But it's still God's church. And Jesus Christ is still its head. And so I offer you today admission into the body of Christ. It's rather simple. It doesn't require a marriage certificate. It doesn't require some initiation ritual, some secret initiation ritual. You don't even have to have or know a Noah handshake. All you really must do according to the Bible is believe in your heart. Confess with your mouth. Do the will of God as a demonstration of your salvation. If there are those today that need to be a part of something that is functional, then we invite you to come. Cast your lot among the people of the Mount Olive Church, but more importantly, begin to foster a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. We extend now to you that invitate, the invitation of an open door to become a part of this fellowship as it is an iteration of the universal fellowship called the church. You may come by baptism, by letter, or by Christian experience. Really doesn't matter how you come. But if you feel the need for the transcendent figure of Jesus Christ in your life, then we implore you, come. 
as the choir sing, the invitation has gone out. Those who will respond are welcome to do so now by simply stepping out of the pew and coming down the aisle to state your intention to become part of the family of the living God. If you're here today, we invite you to come. presence Lord fill me with your presence Lord I long to be 